Hey guys, Carlson here to start off our second semester covering chapter 8, the nervous system. We are going to uh, start off with talking about how the nervous system has anatomical and functional divisions, which is covered in section 1 of the chapter. Um, what the nervous system actually does is monitor the body's internal and external environments, integrate sensory information, and coordinate voluntary and involuntary responses of many other organ systems due to that sensory information. So, um, it's broken down into two main divisions, the peripheral, or the PNS, and the central, or the CNS. And the peripheral is basically all neural tissue outside of the central nervous system. And there are two divisions, the afferent and the efferent. Uh, the afferent will take a uh, sensory signal from the PNS to the central nervous system, and then the efferent will take what, however that information is processed and send a signal back to the peripheral nervous system to affect your organs or tissue to make a response. Um, the efferent division is separated into two parts as well. Uh, the somatic nervous system which will control some kind of skeletal muscle and then the autonomic nervous system or visceral motor system that's going to automatically have an uh, inv involuntary regulation of some kind of smooth muscle like cardiac muscle or some kind of glandular secretion that we don't really have uh, control over ourselves or bodies do it on their own. Uh, the central nervous system then is made up of the brain and spinal cord. Um, this is, uh, it will integrate and coordinate uh, different responses. So it will process uh, sensory data, it will transmit motor commands, and it also seats higher function. So it's going to be the place where we have intelligence, memory, and emotions that are processed here. Um, this is the overview of the nervous system, so basically it starts with the receptors where we get some sort of stimuli from the environment. Okay, and there, there are also sensory receptors uh, viscerally, and that's internal conditions within the body. And that will uh, basically send a message to the peripheral nervous system through the afferent division that will take that to the central nervous system for processing. And then the efferent division will take a command from the central nervous system through the SNS or the ANS depending on what it is, and then we'll have an effect through a muscle movement or through some kind of action through a uh, muscle or some other organ system. All right, now A2 is going to break down um, the specialized intracellular communications and the support cells that are within the nervous system. And um, those support cells of the neurons themselves are called neuroglia. Uh, they're also known as glial cells, and we're going to talk about the difference between the two. Uh, so neural tissue consists of two types. Uh, neurons is one of them. They are the basic unit. All neural functions will involve communication between neurons with themselves or other cells, and most neurons do not retain the ability to divide. Now, neuroglia uh, regulate the environment for the neurons and they support the framework for the neural tissue. They can act as phagocytes, keeping um, basically the neuron tissue or the neural tissue he healthy. And then um, most of them, though, do retain the ability to divide um, and they outnumber the neurons by quite a bit. Um, and the reason why uh, neurons don't divide is because they don't have centrioles. And so this plays a key role in cell division by helping the spindle fibers and um, things move to prop appropriate sizes of the cell during division. Um, there are some neurons, though, uh, usually located in sensory receptors in the nose or in the hippocampus that are exceptions that do contain uh, some neural stem cells to allow for um, new cells to be made and divided there. All right, a little bit more about neurons. Uh, there are four main structures of a typical neuron. The dendrites receive the signals, accents will carry outgoing signals, and then the terminals provide communication between other cells, mostly neurons. Um, this is a picture of a representative neuron. This is actually a multipolar type. Uh, the cell body you can see is here. We have a dendrite off the cell body. The axon is usually quite long, uh, taking those outgoing uh, signals, and it could be myelinated. And then we have axon terminals that are going to meet up with some other cell type. Uh, you also have here um, some organelles. They provide energy and synthesize organic compounds. Some of them probably look familiar to you, mitochondria, Golgi apparatus. We have a nucleus, nucleolus. And then we also have these nissle bodies that are actually like the ribosomes on the rough ER of the nerve cell. 
and they help give color to the cell bodies which make up all of our gray matter. All right, and there's also this axon hillock. This is where an action potential is going to begin. And uh, that was right in this region here. And then we also have something called collaterals. These are areas where axons will actually branch off each other. And right, we classify neurons in two ways. One's by structure. We have multipolar, unipolar, and bipolar neurons. Uh, the multipolar are going to be the most common. Uh, the Unipolar is most sensory neurons of the peripheral nervous system. And then our bipolar are going to be the least common, and they're only in special, special se uh, sense organs. The other way we classify neurons is by function. So we have sensory neurons. They're also known as afferent neurons. There's about 10 million that form the peripheral nervous system. Uh, they receive information from receptors, monitoring the environment, and they will relay information to other neurons in the central nervous system. We also have motor or efferent neurons. There's about half a million that carry instructions from the CNS to other tissues, organs, or systems. The peripheral targets are called effectors because they respond by doing something. And remember, we said that's the somatic nervous system or the autonomic nervous system. And then finally, we have interneurons or association neurons. There's about 20 billion, and they're only in the CNS, so your brain and spinal cord. They interconnect other neurons to distribute sensory information and coordinate motor activity. Uh, the greater the complexity of the uh, action that needs to take place, the more of the number of these interneurons that are going to be involved. Now, uh, these also play a key role in memory planning and learning. Your neuroglia now, so your support cells for the neurons, uh, like I said, they're very abundant. They're half the volume of the nervous system, found in both the CNS and the PNS, and there's more variety in the central nervous system, though. Uh, there are two types in the peripheral. The satellite cells surround and support neuron cell bodies, and then the Schwann cells cover every axon outside of the CNS. Um, that outer membrane is called the neurolemma, so kind of like the cell membrane of the Schwann cell. And um, Schwann cells can only myelinate uh, segments of axon or multiple axons. And there are four types of uh, neuroglia in the central nervous system. We have our astrocytes, which uh, secrete chemicals vital to the maintenance of the blood-brain barrier. We have oligodendrites that myelinate short segments of several axons. We have microglia that are small phagocytic cells that perform protective functions. And then finally, ependymal cells that line the central canal of the spinal cord and um, help to uh, circulate cerebral spinal fluid. Um, the astrocytes are the largest and most abundant, while the uh, microglia are the smallest and least numerous of the neuroglia. And here's a picture from your textbook of the neuroglia and the CNS. And you have your gray matter versus your white matter. So notice that the gray matter, you have a lot of the cell bodies here. Here's a microglial cell. Um, this is a neuron. Um, you have in the white matter more of the axons, the myelinated axons, and here is an astrocyte. You can see it's kind of star looking, which is what that prefix astro is re referring to. Um, let's see what else. Oligodendrites right here. Dendrocytes. Um, ependymal cells up in this region here. All right, and uh, be familiar with the organization of the nervous system. There's a few terms like ganglia um, of the gray matter. It's collections of neuron cell bodies. are called the ganglia. Um, your white matter, uh, there are nerves, uh, which are just bundles of axons in the PNS. So it's what we always refer to as our nerves, our bundles of axons. Um, and so uh, this isn't super important, but just kind of have a general idea. So if you hear the terms used, you kind of have an idea of what we're talking about. Okay, so A3 gets a little more complicated and talks about how an electric potential may result in an action potential, which is also known as a nerve impulse. Um, so all communications between neurons and other cells occurs through membrane surfaces. Uh, these membrane changes are electrical events that occur at great speeds. And a characteristic feature of a living cell is a polarized membrane. And what this means is there is a separation of charge. It's a positive outside and a negative inside. Uh, the separation causes a potential difference from the charges being held apart called a membrane potential. Now, to reach an action potential, a propagated change in the membrane potential, the entire 
uh, plasma membrane must occur. And so there's a few facts you need to know in order to understand that. The potential difference is measured in millivolts, okay, or MV, and the membrane potential of an undisturbed cell in its resting potential of a neuron is negative 70 millivolts. So a nerve cell remains in rest if a balance between the rates of the sodium ion entry and potassium ion loss exists. Now an action potential will then appear when the membrane depolarizes to a level known as the threshold. Um, depolarization is a shift towards zero millivolts and this can be caused by increased positive ions on the inner surface of the membrane and then hyperpolarization is a shift away from zero millivolts caused by potassium ion channels opening. Either one of these can cause an action potential. And information transfer between neurons and other cells involves graded potentials as well along with action potentials and we're gonna talk about the difference here. A graded potential is localized, uh, changes in the membrane potential that cannot spread far from the site of stimulation and this can occur in membranes of all cells due to environmental stimuli and it can tr often trigger specific cell functions. Um, it must lead to an action potential to actually influence operations of large cells like skeletal muscle fibers. Now action potentials then are only with skeletal muscle fibers in the axons of neurons that have excitable membranes that can, can conduct um, action potentials. It starts near the axon hillock and travels the length of the axon. Arrival at the terminal activates the synapses creating the nerve impulse and then every stimulus that brings the membrane to the threshold will generate an identical action potential which is uh, what we call the all or none principle. And there are two types of propagation of an action potential basically uh, leading to an action potential or an impulse. Continuous is when there are chain reactions or little baby steps to transmit the impulse. And saltatory propagation is when the impulse leaps from node to node resulting in a faster transmission. Now, um, this occurs at synapses, which is what 8.4 covers. And we're just going to briefly talk about this and kind of practice it more in class. Um, so the site at which we meet up with another cell is a synapse. And you have a synaptic cleft right here. This is kind of the general structure. Um, but communication is only going to occur in one direction. So an impulse is passed from the terminal of the presynaptic neuron to the postsynaptic neuron, so the one that it's meeting up with, and separated by that narrow space that we've called a synaptic cleft. This is where neurotransmitters are released to pass on information, otherwise known as action potentials. And um, acetylcholine is released at cholergenic synapses. These are the synapses that are widespread inside the central nervous system and outside of it. And major events that occur here are going to be the arrival of the potential, um, the release of a neurotransmitter, binding of acetylcholine, and the depolarization of the postsynaptic membrane, and then removal of acetylcholine by acetylcholine esterase, which should sound a little bit familiar when we talked about uh, a muscle contraction. There are some other common neurotransmitters we're not going to talk in detail about right now, but you can see page 258 for that. Uh, norepinephrine, dopamine, uh, gamma aminobutyric, and serotonin. And we'll kind of get more involved with this in class. So uh, go back, pause and play as you need to, and I will see you guys next time.